Ladies and gentlemen, tonight is November 3rd, 2016, and on behalf of the director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Peter Crane, and the entire staff of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center and the U.S. Army War College, welcome to the first lecture of the 13th annual Brooks Kleber Memorial Lecture Series. The USAHEC and the U.S. Army War College sponsor the Kleber Memorial Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and the warfighting institutions of land power. In addition, as always, we would like to extend a warm thank you to the Army Heritage Center Foundation for their support in this program and everything else we do here at the AHEC. As I said earlier, please be aware that the book for tonight is on sale back in the gift shop, and we will have a book signing after the lecture. Keep in mind, all proceeds from the book sales do go to our foundation uh, and to support the growth of the Army Heritage and Education Center. So to start the evening out, it's my honor to read a little bit of the background about the namesake of the gentleman of this that this lecture is, uh, is named for. Tonight, we honor the memory of Dr. Brooks E. Kleber, the former Deputy Chief Historian of the Office of the Chief of Military History. Dr. Kleber was a native of Trenton, New Jersey, but graduated from Dickinson College in 1940. He entered the Army in August of 1941 and went on to Officer Candidate School and was assigned to the 90th Infantry Division. He and his unit arrived in Normandy on D-Day, plus five, and he earned a bronze star for gallantry in action. He was captured by the Germans on June 26th, June 26th 1944, and remained a guest of the German Army until the end of the war. In early 1945, as the Allies closed in, the German Army began moving POWs from, uh, from the more valuable, or I'm sorry, vulnerable camps. Dr. Kleber was ordered to make one of these moves, and he went, when he went, he took with him two books in addition to his personal effects, A History of Colonial America and The Common People, People 1746 to 1938. It says a great deal, of course, about the man that he treasured these books, enough to carry them with him throughout the remainder of the war until he was liberated by American troops in 1945. After being honorably discharged from the Army in 1945 and returning to civilian life, he entered the University of Pennsylvania where he completed his master's and his doctorate. While pursuing his doctorate, he was hired in 1950 as the historian of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. In 1963, when the Chemical Corps was dissolved, he became the chief historian for the Continental Army Command at Fort Story, Virginia. In 1973, he became the chief historian for the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command at Fort Story. And in 1980, he was appointed as the deputy chief historian of the U.S. Army, where he remained until his retirement in 1987. Dr. Kleber was active in the U.S. Army Reserves from his discharge in 1945 until his retirement in 1987, attaining the rank of colonel. Near the end of his career, Dr. Kleber presented the books he carried as a POW in Europe to the U.S. Army Military History Institute, part of the Army Heritage and Education Center. And if you ever have the opportunity, we are pleased and humbled to preserve both of them and the story of the sacrifice they represent. Those books are on display in a special case in our reading room, if you ever have the opportunity to get over there. So tonight, we welcome Dr. Beverly Eddy to speak in honor of Dr. Kleber by presenting the next in our series of lectures. Dr. Beverly Eddy is a professor emerita of German at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, right here. And she has author, authored numerous books as well as other works, including Camp Sharp's Psycho Boys from, Germany, uh, from Gettysburg to Germany, which is the subject for tonight, and Abbey's Ghosts and Castles, a guide to the folk history of the Middle Rhine. Dr. Eddy holds a Bachelor of Arts in Speech and Theater from the College of Worcester, Ohio, and graduated from Indiana University with both a, both, both a Master's of Arts in German Literature and a PhD in German Literature, Linguistics, and Scandinavian Literature. She also has courses in Norwegian at the Johann Wolfgang von, excuse me, Goeth, Goeth Universität in Germany and the University uh, of Oslo in Norway. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Beverly Eddy. Thank you. What I'd like to do tonight is just share with you my fascination with just a handful 
of the men who were sent to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, to do intensive training in psychological warfare during World War II. I'd like to start by saying that at the time, very little was known about them. Their training was secret, there were no phones at the camp, and no visitors allowed on the grounds. Because of the secrecy, it wasn't until the release of classified army documents that one could learn a little bit about what actually went on there. I have studied these materials, read the memoirs of some of the soldiers, and interviewed nine veterans at the camp. Today, I'd like to give a brief sense of how and why the camp was founded, and then follow the stories of five of its veterans. Let's see if this, there we go. As far as military intelligence goes, the United States entered the Second World War rather ill-prepared. The European war had been going on for over two years before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, but it wasn't until June 1942 that the Army opened a military intelligence training center at Fort Ritchie, Maryland. It was at Ritchie, then called Camp Ritchie, that the Army opened a military uh, a first mobile radio broadcasting company or MRB company for service in North Africa and in the Italian campaign. This unit arrived in North Africa in March 1943 and joined forces with British propaganda experts in a highly successful campaign that proved that psychological warfare was, in Eisenhower's words, one of the most important supporting weapons of modern warfare. As a result, it was decided to expand the role of psychological warfare and to send the men specializing in that aspect of intelligence to a smaller and more secret camp than Camp Ritchie. This new camp was established on the edge of the Gettysburg battlefield in McMillan Woods. Four mobile radio broadcasting companies trained here making a total of about 800 men. The regular army men would often refer to them as psycho boys, although some thought that that meant they were medics. Because nearly three quarters of the men who trained in Gettysburg were Jews, the Camp Sharp men frequently called it Camp Shapiro. Um, as you can see in the picture, there's not much left of the camp now but it's surprising that somehow the tradition has lived on. The only thing that's left of the original camp is the flagpole that you see in the lower picture. The barracks were torn down and rows of pine trees are planted now where those barracks were. It's now a youth camp and it's rather ironic that the uh, director of the youth camp is has his quarters where the commandant of Camp Sharp had his, that the camp now has porta potties where there were the Camp Sharp latrines, and the um, horse trailer turnaround is in the spot where the motor pool was at the time that the camp was held. The Camp Sharp men were rather an odd lot. About of the about a third of them were emigrants from Austria and Germany who had fled Hitler, come to the United States, and were now soldiers in the US Army preparing to return to Europe to use their special knowledge of Germany in the fight against the Nazis. All of them were fluent in at least two languages, with German, French, and Italian being the most common. In the first company of 164 soldiers, just to give you an example, 33 different languages were spoken. These men were trained in Gettysburg by quite a remarkable man. Lieutenant Hans Habe was an extremely colorful and some would say controversial figure. He was a Hungarian Jew by birth and a newspaper man by trade. 
Even before America's entry into the war, he had proved his abilities on the battlefield as a volunteer in the French Foreign Legion. He had been captured, imprisoned, and later, with the help of French friends, had escaped from a German prison camp. He then emigrated to America, quickly became an American citizen, and turned his prison camp experiences into a best-selling novel, also a movie with Spencer Tracy. In 1942, Haba married Eleanor Post Hutton, the heiress of General Foods. It was his third marriage and her fourth. <laughs> Through the spectacular success of his novel and the wealth of his wife, Haba became a prominent figure in the Washington social scene. When his wife gave birth to their son, Eleanor Roosevelt served as godmother. In 1943, Hobb had been sent from Camp Ritchie to serve with the first mobile radio broadcasting company in Africa. There he had been so skilled in interrogating prisoners at the front and in composing effective propaganda leaflets that he was brought back to the States in the fall to develop these skills in four new MRB companies. He was given a free hand to develop the curriculum as he thought best. He was also allowed access to the Army's card indexes so that he could handpick the soldiers whom he wanted to train. Besides linguistic skills, Habe looked for men who had been active in media and the arts, as well as for men who knew how to sell a product. He picked an artist who had worked in the Walt Disney Studios on Pinocchio and Fantasia. He picked an American cookbook author, a Bulgarian composer, a Czech filmmaker, a number of Austrian actors, the music critic for the New York Times, a butterfly specialist, and a Hollywood special effects man. He also selected men who were teachers or college professors, radio personalities, and journalists, as well as insurance salesmen, railroad workers, and tradesmen. All of them were multilingual, and all of them were knowledgeable about European affairs, either through living abroad or through intense study. Depending on their previous experience, the men's training at Sharp could last from one week to three months. Here, the men trained for a variety of assignments. Some might be sent to film or take photographs in the battle zones and later the concentration camps for propaganda purposes. Some would broadcast in different languages to local populations as well as to the Germans. Some would serve as translators and interpreters. Some would interrogate prisoners and civilians. Some would produce propaganda pamphlets and posters in record time for the changing war conditions. These men were men that were all trained to work directly in the front lines. Some of these men had a particularly dangerous task called hog calling. This involved driving out in front of the Allied lines to speak directly to the German soldiers by microphone and to urge them to surrender. On the first day of classes in Gettysburg, the students were stunned to see a man walk briskly into the room from the back, stride to the front of the room, pause, and then turn so that everybody could admire him. Here, they thought, was an actor and a fop. Contrary to army regulations, Habe dyed his hair chestnut red with blonde highlights. Behind his back, many of his men called him Goldilocks, he also made subtle adjustments to his uniform each day so that he could create a small sensation with each entrance. But in spite of his foppishness, Habe was an effective instructor who won the grudging admiration of the worst skeptics. One of the Czech soldiers noted, he was amazing. He was by turns German teacher, journalist, 
radio director, political lecturer, copy editor, language teacher, voice trainer, psychology professor, whatever the course material required. Hobbit selected the area of specialization for each man in the four MRB companies. Ultimately, these men would be split into small teams before the D-Day landing. Once they made the channel crossing, they would be dispersed among the different army units in France. At Sharp, however, Hobbit insisted that the men learn all aspects of all types of psychological warfare so that they would be prepared for any situation that arose at the front. And I would add here, even the drivers that drove the hog collars out to the front had to be multilingual and trained so that they could take over in case the man doing the hog calling was killed. At any rate, with the training behind them, these 800 men of Camp Sharp were transported to England and sent across the channel to put their learning into actual practice. And tonight I want to talk about four of these men, the work they did, and how it helped in the war against Hitler. The first, Stefan Heim, was a German Jew. And, like Habe, a best-selling novelist who'd had his book written, uh, made into a Hollywood film. He was 31 years old when he came to Gettysburg. His American fiance came with him and lived in the Gettysburg Hotel while he was stationed there. Hobbit selected Stefan Heim to combat the Germans through writing. He was to compose leaflets that could be loaded into shells and fired directly into enemy lines or packed in bomb casings and dropped over German towns. Later in the war, Hobbit, uh, Heim would write texts for radio broadcasts and would serve as editor of a regional German language newspaper. One of Heim's propaganda assignments was particularly interesting to me. He was ordered to write a leaflet that could be dropped over the island of Cezambre that would persuade the soldiers occupying the island to surrender to the Allies. It was crucial, he was told, that the Allies clear this island because it blocked the entrance to the major harbor of Saint Malo, and this made it nearly impossible for the Allies to get the reinforcements needed for their advance on Paris. During the summer, the Allies had bombarded this island with land artillery, naval artillery, and airstrikes. And in mid-August, they'd even dropped some of the first napalm bombs on it. But the garrison had held. Now, on September 1st, Heim was given free hand as to what to write. He decided that, instead of writing, he would appeal to the Axis soldiers graphically by simply showing a picture of the island as a target with an extra large bomb coming in to land there. The leaflets were quickly printed up and scattered over the island, and within hours, the first white flags appeared at the opening of the battlements, and the first soldiers came out with their hands in the air. It turned out that many of these soldiers were Poles and they would not have been able to read a propaganda pamphlet in German. Now they came out and surrendered in spite of the opposition of their German officers. The official surrender came the following day. The second man I'd like to talk about today was a more unlikely soldier than Stefan Heim, and yet he was put into considerably more danger at the front. Cy Levin was a young art student, a Polish-born Jew, who got into the army only by concealing the fact that he had spent time in a mental ward. When he came to Gettysburg, he was 26 years old. One would have thought that Hans Habe would have selected this young artist to design pamphlets. Instead, after initially accepting him as an interpreter, he was singled out for hog calling. 
Probably, because he was only five feet, two and a half inches tall, and therefore a small target. At least that's what he told me. It was his task to go out in front of the front lines, speak directly to the German soldiers, and persuade them to surrender. Levin quickly developed an effective argument for getting Germans to surrender, one which actually broke official army rules. First, though, he established rapport with the Germans, saying in part, by now I hope you will have finished breakfast. Do you want to know what I had? Shit on a shingle. Do you know what that is? It's actually quite tasty. Chipped beef on toast. It was forbidden to say anything bad of any of the Allied forces, but Levin knew that the Germans were much more afraid of the Russians than they were of the Americans. So he told them about the Russian troop movements in the East. Then he said, who do you want to reach Berlin first, the Russians or the Americans? End this damn war. It's time you get home, make babies, and rebuild Germany. Levin also came up with what was one of the most successful propaganda actions of the war. His own battlefield experiences had convinced him that the traditional choice of death or surrender was useless against soldiers trained to follow orders. They were also immune to political arguments and patriotism. Just give them definite, simple instructions on how to surrender, he said to his superiors. Then Levin devised a simple, phonetic way to teach the enemy soldiers how to say, I surrender, in English. Tiny leaflets with these two words were dropped all over the enemy lines. Levin was proven right. He learned from many of the just captured prisoners that they had been practicing the correct pronunciation of I surrender so that they could say it correctly when needed. On a psychological level, this made the Germans more comfortable about the idea of surrender. And on a practical level, it gave the German soldiers confidence that they could make their wishes known at once to the Allied soldier and lessen the risk of being shot in error. His commanding officer noted later that Cy Levin prepared 20 different pamphlets with these pronunciation instructions and that more than a million copies were printed during the Brittany campaign and fired directly into German lines. My third sharp soldier of the day was an overweight German Jew named Benno Frank. He was 37 when he came to Gettysburg. Frank had trained as an actor in Germany before becoming a highly effective opera director in Palestine and in the United States. Habe assigned Frank to broadcasting and as a broadcaster, Frank became the most effective American radio propagandist of the war. His first major assignment was to Lorient, near the German submarine base at Karaman. As was the case with Cezanne, the Allies had tried unsuccessfully to destroy the submarine pens there by dropping 4,000 tons of bombs on them. The town of Lorient had been completely leveled by the time Benno Frank was sent there. He and a team of eight men were ordered there, ostensibly in order to soften German morale prior to an all-out Allied attack of the garrison. In reality, no Allied attack ever came, and Lorient became a laboratory for testing the skills of the broadcasters since the men had free reign to develop their sustained propaganda attacks against the Germans entrenched there. Most of this work was experimental. The Allies had discovered mailbags full of personal letters to the men in the garrison that had never been delivered. 
General Frank and his team now read these letters over the radio and by doing so secured a huge listening audience. For all of these broadcasts, Benno Frank assumed the role of a Captain Ungers, who said he had once served in the German army, but that he was now an American army captain, something actually highly unlikely. <laughs> As one of his teammates said, Benno could sell anyone anything. Over the radio, he knew when to shout and when to whisper. He spoke of everything near and dear to the heart of the German soldiers, and did so so effectively that many of the deserters asked specifically to surrender to Captain Ungers. He was so effective, his teammates said, because of the almost complete lack of orthodoxy in his approach. That approach nearly got him into trouble when, without clearing this broadcast with anyone, he announced over the radio one day, come on over to our side. If you don't like it here, after a 30-hour trial period, you'll be free to go back. <laughs> On my honor, I will see to it that you are sent back. Ask for Captain Ungers. Well, the promise seemed to be a safe one. Surely no one who voluntarily deserted would want to return to the besieged garrison. But the day came when an ardent Nazi named Fridolin Hoff was captured, and at the end of his 30-hour imprisonment, he asked to be sent back to the German lines. Frank persuaded his superior to let the man leave, since this could be turned to their advantage. He saw to it that Hoff was loaded down with candy bars, cigarettes, gum, and canned food, and sent back to his unit. Frank then made the most of this in the broadcast that followed. He said that Hoff had not liked it in the American lines, but he was the only dissatisfied customer among many hundreds, and his release was true evidence that he, Captain Honors, was a man who kept his word. From then on, Benno Frank would refer to Hoff as a kind of travel agent in Lorient. Ask Hopf, Captain Ongers would say. You'll find him in bunker number six, barracks four. Benno Frank was so effective during the nine weeks that he was broadcasting to the enemy forces that an average of 20 German soldiers deserted each day, even though not a shot was being fired anywhere near them. This equaled over 1,200 surrendering soldiers. After the program was discontinued, the radio team was sent to Radio Luxembourg and no more prisoners were taken in Lorient. But Benno Frank went to Luxembourg and there he was active in Operation Annie, which was a black operation in which the broadcasters pretended that they were a legitimate German radio station broadcasting from inside Germany. Here, Frank created a new persona for himself. Now he was a German officer retired from active service because of wounds. The head of Operation Annie's programming said, quote, Bruno was really the voice of Operation Annie. It was full, rasping, mature, and it spoke with an unmistakable Rhein Hessian accent. As many inter interrogations with military and civilian prisoners later revealed, you had to believe what he was saying." End of quote. Operation Annie's biggest day came soon after the Allies were at the Rhine River and took the Remagen Bridge. Another Allied force had secured a bridgehead near Andernach. Between these two points, Nazi troops in the Eiffel Mountains had plenty of room for retreat. But because Frank told his German radio listeners that there was only one way out, most of the remaining Wehrmacht marched right into an Allied ambush. I 
I'd like to leave Benno Frank here and turn to the unlikeliest hero from Camp Sharp. This man was Count Igor Cassini. He had been born in Russia, but his family had had to flee during the Russian Revolution, and he had spent his childhood living in Mussolini's Italy. At the time he came to Camp Sharp, Cassini was a well-known 29-year-old gossip columnist who wrote under the name of Charlie Knickerbocker. Cassini was forced upon Hans Habe. Habe did not trust his background. He felt that a white Russian growing up under Mussolini should not be entrusted with work in military intelligence. As a consequence, Cassini went through an extra long training period in Gettysburg where he was extremely popular among his fellow soldiers. And he was in no hurry at all to be sent to Europe to serve anywhere close to the front lines. It was probably a relief to both Hans Habe and Cassini then when he was transferred out of the Psych Warfare Division and joined Stars and Stripes, the US Army newspaper, where he and seven other reporters rotated journalistic assignments to the front. At one of his rotations, he was assigned to Nuremberg, Germany. He filed his story, then decided to find a German Luger pistol that he could take back to Paris as a souvenir. The city had been bombed to smithereens, but Cassini knew that Nuremberg was laced with underground passages and catacombs that had been built hundreds of years ago to store the beer that was made in the town's numerous breweries. Cassini figured that these catacombs were a logical place for the Nazis to hide weapons. He walked inside one of the entranceways, turned on his flashlight, and came face to face with the German officer. Before Cassini had time to react, this officer offered Cassini his gun and said in excellent English, may I surrender, sir? The officer was not alone. With him were 1,200 German soldiers and 2,000 civilians who had sought refuge from the bombing in this underground labyrinth. Cassini stepped from the entrance, signaled to a group of nearby troops, and they came over to round up the prisoners. As Cassini put it, he then, quote, set off on a glorious spree, one of the forms of sanity for which I have a gift. Despite the confusion of capturing 3,200 Germans by mistake, I managed to get my Luger. And by the time I reported back to Paris, I also had two cars, three motorcycles, two typewriters, two French girls, and a liberated Italian prisoner of war, Antonio, who became my valet for a month. At the end of the war, Cassini left the army with an honorable discharge and three battle stars. Many of the sharp men, however, stayed on in Germany and continued working there in the control phase of the occupation. Here they had a variety of assignments. They reestablished regional newspapers and radio stations throughout Germany. They interrogated German civilians seeking reinstatement in state jobs. They translated at the Nuremberg trials and, again, under Habe's supervision, they set up a single German-language newspaper for the American zone that became the most important daily newspaper in Germany. As time went on, however, Habe became increasingly disenchanted with the American military government's idea of re-educating the Germans. He complained that the Americans equated re-education with Americanization, and that they defined culture as popular culture instead of in the European sense of high culture. In 
He left his position with the newspaper in 1949 in order to try new ventures in Germany and the United States. He also acquired three new wives. <laughs> but he also suffered a great personal tragedy when his daughter, home on vacation from college, was murdered by the Charles Manson gang. Habe then settled in Switzerland, where he continued writing best-selling novels, including several that were critical, very critical, I might add, of America's post-war policies in Germany. One of them that I found particularly interesting is the status of black American soldiers in World War II. So he wrote a novel about one of them that came back to the States, and the racism was so extreme in the States that he moved back to Germany where he'd been treated better. And it's, it's a tragic story, but it's a, it's a very interesting, interesting one to read. Okay. Let's... Stefan Heim had worked closely with Hans Habe on his newspapers, but in 1945 he was recalled to the States and discharged honorably from the army because of what the government regarded as his pro-communist leanings. He became increasingly disenchanted with the United States and when America entered the Korean War, he returned his medals and his bronze star to the government in protest. He and his American wife then moved to East Germany. He continued writing his novels in English, however, right up through the 1970s. And if you want to read about the mobile radio broadcasting companies and what they did, he wrote a roman a clay about exactly what they did called the Crusaders. It's a marvelous work, and I'd recommend it. Anyway, on a personal level, <clears throat> Heim remained a dissident. When the Berlin Wall fell, he was elected to the German parliament, but he resigned in protest when the members of parliament voted themselves a hefty pay raise. He died while on a visit to Israel. Cy Levin came home from the war early. When he had entered the concentration camp of Buchenwald, he had suffered a complete mental breakdown and he was sent back on a hospital ship to the States to recuperate. Eventually, he was released and sent back, uh, and sent out so that he could return to his art. Um, he said he never really was cured, and he was under psychiatric treatment all his life, and he lived, as you say, to be 96. Um, and quite a number of these men when they went into Buchenwald you can imagine, these men were German Jews. Their relatives had been murdered in these camps. And it, it must have been absolutely horrendous. Anyway, Cy Levin became actually one of the pioneers of the graphic novel. He produced one about the nightmare of the concentration camps and one about the lure and futility of war. That's the one here called Parade. And you can see it has a foreword by Art Spiegelman, who wrote Mouse and regarded Cy Levin as his mentor. Levin died at a Quaker nursing home in Gwyneth, Pennsylvania. And there is a small museum in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, that is devoted to his art. After the war, Benno Frank was kept on in Berlin to serve as the American military government's chief of theater and music. Here he tried to serve as a cultural mediator by seeing to it that only the very best plays by German and American dramatists were performed in Germany. He first ran into trouble with America's anti-communist witch hunts when he began receiving arbitrary and conflicting weekly directives as to which plays and playwrights could now no longer be performed in Germany. 
1948, he resigned his position and returned to the United States where he had a long career as a theater and opera director who specialized in biracial productions. He retired to Israel and died soon afterwards. Igor Cassini resumed his career as a popular gossip columnist with a readership estimated at 20 million. And if you've ever heard the expression jet set, he's the one that coined that phrase. He also hosted two popular TV shows, married four more times, and maintained residences in his later years in Spain and in Italy. Before moving abroad, Cassini got into trouble with the United States government when the Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo became a client of a public relations firm in which Cassini had a minor interest. As a consequence, he was indicted for failure to register as an agent of a foreign government. Unrepentant, Cassini wrote his memoirs, giving them the title, I Do It All Over Again. When I spoke with the veterans of Camp Sharp, I heard all of them express the same idea, that despite the disruption to their lives and the horrors they encountered at the front and at the concentration camps, they, quote, would do it all over again. What I found most interesting about these men was their idealism. They had fought in the war with words and images rather than with rifles. They had shown that they were more interested in preserving ideals than in extinguishing lives. And to my mind, that makes their achievements especially admirable. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a few moments for questions and answers. If you'll please raise your hand if you have a question and let myself or Sarah come to you with one of the microphones so that we make sure we get you on the recording. So do we have anybody to start off with? Right here. Uh, the, the, the men are getting pretty old now. Is there any that are left? Um, I interviewed nine of them. Um, this book came out in 2014. Five of the nine have now died. So four are still, still there. And I'm very pleased that as a result of the book, the uh, families of these vets have, have gotten interested in them. And so one of them then decided to write his own book about his adventures. And another one, um, his daughter married a, a film producer who's making a documentary film about his life. Uh, and the Holocaust Museum did an interview with, with one of them. So that, I find that very gratifying. So the American military must have learned a lot from what they've done um, during this war. Did you do any research or have any knowledge of how they've carried some of this work forward um, uh, from that point in time? Uh, as a matter of fact, I do. One of the people that I interviewed, um, you know, when you're in class, there's one person who takes notes that are better than anyone else's. He, he was the one in his class that took the best notes in Habe's classes. And so after the war, um, someone from PSYOPs came and asked for those notes for the military to use at Fort Bragg. And uh, that was the day before you had copy machines. And so he lent them his notes. And uh, then about three years later, he thought, you know, I'd really like to have those back. And so he asked to get them back, and he was told that he couldn't get them because they were classified. <laughs> and so um, when I interviewed him, I said at the end of the interview, is there anything I can do for you? And he said, yeah, you can get me my class notes. And uh, 
surprisingly, they had just been declassified. So he got them back. And Cy Levin, the, the one who did the I Surrender pamphlet, the hog collar, uh, was invited to, to Fort Bragg, I think it was four years ago, to talk about what he had done. And he was given an honor there. So obviously there's a tradition of this. I, I'm sure there are people in the audience that know more about this than I do. But uh, would you like to say something? Um, you talk about the, the legacy. Um, it, it's hard to explain literally how foundational and many of the techniques, as we call like target audience analysis. And you have some, some men here that knew the audiences better than obviously anyone would ever know. Um, but their notes and, and the way they're very innovative, almost entrepreneurs, if you will, and we still use a lot of their techniques today. Uh, because they've stood the test of time. Um, these are some um, amazing folks that ne have not gotten a lot of recognition. But uh, thanks to Dr. Eddie, they, they've, they've gotten some. It's amazing. I think Hans Haube in particular. I mean, he developed those courses from scratch. And uh, it's just amazing to me uh, all the things that he taught them, all the techniques that he taught them in so many different areas. And uh, it was effective, obviously. The Camp Sharp was active around the same time as the, the German POW camp in Gettysburg. Yes. And what did the community at, at large know about these men? And were they able to mingle with the population? 800 men, what did they do in their off time? Um, the, the commissioned officers were allowed to go to bars. If you were not a commissioned officer, you could go to restaurants, but you couldn't go to bars. Several of them had wives and girlfriends that lived in town, like Stefan Heim, uh, throughout the war. Now, everything was kept secret. But the uh, interesting thing is, yes, there was a German prisoner of war camp that was about a half a mile from where Camp Sharp is. And when the Camp Sharp men went into town for their recreation, they walked right by this German prison camp. And since so many of them were Germans and Austrians, they'd be speaking German as they went by this prison camp. And they would be heckled by the prisoners, saying, oh, we know what you're doing. We know what you're up to. Um, whether they did or not, I don't know. But, uh, it was an interesting interaction. The, uh, the uh, Habe did not have his men do any practice uh, interrogations with German prisoners in this country. Uh, when they did their practice interrogations, they did it with each other and were critiqued. But he did not want them doing it here. For one thing is, these men were designed for work at the front. Very different kind of interrogation of what you do with the men when they've been brought over to the States or taken over to England. What they were trained to do, essentially, was not to, not to find out you know, where they're going to attack next or where they are. They were there to gauge the morale. Because if they understood the morale, then they could appeal to them uh, in a better way. And Benno Frank is a very brilliant example of that because at Lorient, when these men, um, when these men gave up and came over, he would interview them. And what he would do is he would ask them about, what do you think of the lieutenant in charge of you? And then he brought in an Austrian actor who was good at mimicking voices and accents. And he would then put him on the air doing these ridiculous, you know, throwing a tizzy fit uh, about a German because he hadn't made his bed right or something. Um, and so that he would, he would then turn it and use it for the Germans. They also had a, had a great technique that they knew a lot of what was going on and they did get to know a lot of these men. And so when they were interrogating people that had just been taken prisoner, 
and uh, the the they would ask them a question, and the and the German would say, you know name rank serial number, and then they would say, well, we know that you're working with so and so, that you have so many men, that you've come from here, that you've lost here, and that you're doing this, and that would completely throw the, the German prisoners off guard because they think. Oh, well, they know it all. And so then they would feel free to talk about the things that these men were really trying to get at, which was essentially questions of morale and how better to break it down. I mentioned earlier uh, that the skills and techniques that they develop is still taught today. Where is the Department of Defense camp story today? Where are these skills taught today? <laughs> the, uh, the Psychological Operations Regiment that we have now uh, falls under the uh, United States uh, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the same place where they train uh, the Green Berets that you might be more familiar with where the school started from. But before the Green Beret School, it was known, it was also known as the Psy War School based upon uh, the work of folks like this. But that's still where it's taught today. Did any of these individuals that you were fortunate enough to interview, did they have any contact as the war was ending and perhaps did end with comparable um, individuals that would have been on the German side since we're talking about Europe or the Soviets? Was there any kind of involvement uh, in that? Now remember that most of these were German Jews, German and Austrian Jews. So there's a lot of stories about them going back to their hometowns and uh, finding anti-Semites living in their house. And they would say, what happened to the Jews that used to live here? Oh, they sold it to us. They went to America. When they knew very well that their family had died in the concentration camps. One of the men that I talked to, I, I just found this rather devastating. He, um, his family had lived in the area of Bergen-Belsen, of the camp. And so he took an army jeep and the microphone. And he drove through the camp, back and forth, saying into the microphone, are there any Jews from Göttingen named Rosenberg here in the camp? And he didn't get any answer at all. About three years after the war, a cousin contacted him from New Orleans saying, I was in the camp, I heard you call, but I was too weak to answer. So I, I found the two chapters of the book that interest me the most, because I'm not a military historian, um, is how they reacted when they went into the camps and then what happened when they visited their homes. I, I guess a, a third thing that surprised me was how many of them were very disillusioned with American politics after the war, policies after the war. And uh, the more research I'm doing into the period on another topic, I'm finding that this was true of most of the German immigrants who came to America, that they had thought that they were fighting with the Americans to defeat Nazism. And as soon as the war was over, America was more interested in its Cold War with Russia. And they weren't doing all these programs of re-education that they had promised that they would do with the Germans. And they were using former Nazis and giving them positions to further this. And uh, that must have been very, very difficult for some of these people. Do we have any other questions? Oh, up here in front. You mentioned that the life story of 
Lieutenant Habe and one of the other people, Sergeant Haim, I think, were turned into movies. Do you know the names of those two movies? I knew you were going to ask. I know the Haim movie. It's called Hostage, Hostages. And it's about the, uh, the murder of the uh, German SS leader, Heydrich, and the uh, punishment that was taken out against the, uh, the population in, in Czechoslovakia for doing that. The, um, I'm, I'm calling a blank on the, uh, on the name of the Haber movie. Uh, it's something when something fall, uh, but I can't, it's, it's, it slipped my mind, I'm sorry. With these men being so close to the front lines, um, what was the casualty rate or maybe even POW rate of them? Quite low. Unless you were a hog collar, um, you were pretty safe. Although um, one of the men that I interviewed um, had a close call. Um, they, you know, when, when German prisoners of war were taken, they kept their ranks in the prison camp to keep order and such. And um, there, were, there was one camp in, in Metz where a lot of German prisoners were being murdered. And they were being murdered because the Nazis, the, the diehard Nazis, were murdering anybody who expressed any doubt about Hitler winning the war or said anything, anything negative about Hitler. And so this particular guy was sent into the camp to find out what was going on. And they arranged it by getting him a uh, SS officer's uniform and sending him in with a group of prisoners. And he was supposed to nose around and find out what was happening. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the, uh, the Nazis figured out who he was and why he was there. And he had a secret word that he called out. And he called it out, and it was ignored. <laughs> and uh, he came very close to being, being killed. But most of the ones that were killed were the hog collars. They were the ones out in front speaking into the microphone. When they first started doing this, the microphone was mounted on the Jeep. Easy target for the Germans. Very easy target. Then they caught on, and they started running their loudspeakers out from the Jeep in different directions so that they'd be less likely to do it. But uh, there were quite a number of casualties there and of the drivers. Um, I talked to one driver, and uh, I was absolutely convinced that the drivers are sort of unsung heroes of the war. As I said, they had to go through the training. They were multilingual. They had to do all this stuff. But they were drivers and mechanics doing it. And quite a number of them also got killed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite uh, Colonel Crane, our director, up here to the front. We have a quick presentation, uh, and then uh, we'll have a few announcements. And of course, uh, you can go purchase a book and have it signed if you'd like. Okay, thanks. Dr. Eddie, vielen Dank für Ihren wunderbaren Lehrreich, Vortrag. Bitte sehr. Das war sehr interessant und lehrreich. So, um, thank you so much for this evening. As you could tell by the number of questions that we had tonight, uh, you definitely struck uh, the interest of everyone in the room. And I was judging, I, was, I always like to sit in the back of the room and, and watch folks, and there were a lot of folks nodding heads and, and truly were engaged. It's, it's a fantastic topic, and uh, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. So I would, uh, I hope this finds a place of honor for you. This is, uh, a copy of oh, nice. uh, our advertisement of your lecture tonight. So, oh, wonderful. Uh, thank so you. a little uh, token of our appreciation. Thank you. So very, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you.